Good evening and welcome to the Select Board Board of Health Sewer Commissioner's meeting of August 21st, 2024. It's 6 p.m. This meeting will be held in a hybrid fashion with the opportunity for both in-person attendance and remote participation. Please note that while an option for remote attendance and or participation is being provided as a courtesy to the public, the meeting hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technological problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless otherwise required by law. Members of the public with particular interest in any specific item on this agenda should make plans for in-person versus virtual attendance accordingly. The meeting will be held in person in the main meeting room of Deerfield Municipal Offices in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A. Anyone intending to record the meeting must identify themselves to the clerk, Blake Gilmore, and provide their name and address for the record. <clears throat> so we'll call the meeting to order, and uh, at this time we are We'll entertain public comment for two minutes from anyone in the audience who wants to step up to the mic and say anything up. Please. Oops. Charlene Galinsky, 342 River Road. I've had the opportunity to go to a few meetings um, to learn more about the 1888 building, and I attended one. Uh, in person and then I had I also have been watching some and I I have a, a serious question to ask before consideration was made to even look at that building for the town hall was there a um, and I, I know the name of the type of person that does this an industrial hygienist looking at the building to say that that bottom floor that has water in it and that was confirmed at both meetings and that upper floor that has bat feces and rodent feces, um, and that was said at the meetings. Uh, did did a, uh, an expert come in to verify that that building was really a building that was viable for town offices? And the reason I'm concerned is we hired an industrial uh, hygienist to look at the farmhouse that just burnt, and. Uh, received an 18-page report about carcinogens that are now in the house and fungal uh, debris, etc. And um, I looked up this gentleman who came to our farmhouse. He is the one that was involved in the courthouse in Springfield where the employees sued the state because the state was saying that the uh, courthouse was good to go and they were, they were going to do some things to it but they, the people were still getting sick. This gentleman went in there and he found a particular material that showed it uh, can cause neurological damage. And I understand two of the judges died of ALS in that courthouse. Whether it was connected, it never said. So my concern, honestly, is for the town employees who are going to be going into that building once it's renovated. Has there been a thorough uh, expert look at that building, especially the bottom floor and the top floor. So we don't respond to comments, as you know. So um, Sometimes you, you do, because I did yeah, watch a meeting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to do what we're supposed to do. So we, there have been many expert um, opinions about the building. And, the, and of course, the, the program anticipates a complete renovation and removal of all asbestos containing materials, lead paint containing materials, um, hazardous substances that might be in there, water mitigation in the basement. So the short answer is it would be like a brand new building except in a 1888 exterior. I understand that and I, I think the concern is that this is an old building that has had these problems over many years. Um, it's hard some of this stuff may be embedded in things because we learned that there are porous, semi-porous, and non-porous materials. Porous and semi-porous are the ones you have to be worried about because mm -hmm. that's where this stuff goes and stays. And I don't know how you know if that's happened in that building if you haven't had, we had 10 samples taken throughout the farmhouse and those 10 samples showed a, you know, a, like I said, an 18 page report. The other. Okay, Charlene, we, we okay. understand your concern and we'll certainly look into it. Um, I, I don't want you to look into it. I just would like an answer. Can somebody send me a letter that says who the experts were and if there was a report, I'd like to see the report. We'll have research done on it and see what we can provide for you. Okay, thank and you. And in, in the interim, 
if it hasn't been done, it will be done because there's no interest in making anybody risk their lives working in a municipal building. No, and right. that's my concern. Right. Correct. And I think as the other members of the Board of Selectmen, we want to hear about it too. So yep. we're, we're, we're on the same page with Good. you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Anyone online? Um, okay, well, since there are no further comments, um, I'd invite Mr. Reno up uh, to talk about uh, the event. Yes, hello, thank you. Thanks for having me. And to get identify, me to be a, identify yeah. yourself and. Uh, uh, yes, I'm John Reno. I, I uh, grew up in South Deerfield. Uh, I live on Gramacki Ave. Wonderful. So tell us a little bit about the 5K. Uh, it's a 5K, 10K. It's, um, it starts at Park Street, center of South Deerfield, in front of the dental office. Uh, proceeds up Hillside. Um, and, half, and the people that are doing the 5K um, get about halfway up the hill, turn around and come back. And the people that are doing the 10K proceed around the mountain, do a little out and back on Crestview, and finish at the town center. So the start finish is on Park Street. And uh, this is a fundraiser? Yes, I represent the Massachusetts Senior Games. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they put on um, numerous, numerous sports activities, uh, everything from, um, you know, baseball, basketball, ice hockey, the standards, to cornhole, shuffleboard, darts, billiards. Mm -hmm. um, and each state has its own um, um, organization. And then every two years, they get together for what you might call the Senior Olympics, and mm -hmm. it's called Nationals. Right. Um, and that's gonna be happening next July. So this, is, this race is a qualifying event. For people that are 50 and over, they, can, they will qualify to go to Nationals in Des Moines, Iowa. Wonderful. Yeah. And I see you have your Massachusetts Senior Games sure. t-shirt on. Representing, the, representing here today. Well, so, uh, well, being a senior myself, I see that you've checked with uh, Chief Pacheric as far as the road goes itself. What have you done for any first aid type setups if you have somebody that has a problem on the road, on the, the run itself? Uh, have you notified uh, South County or do you have people your own that are gonna be working to make sure that everybody makes it through the course and you know, anybody stuck on the side of the road? Right, so I mean, I, I definitely sweep the course after the event, um, checking for any problems or trash. Um, I also, um, you know, 911 with the South County, the fire department's right less than a mile away from the center of town. Um, so that's, that's never really been, it's never come up, and we hope that it never will, of course, right. but, but um, yeah. I'm just thinking it might, might be good for you to notify them just to let them know that you're there and you're doing your thing. Sure, I can do that, yeah. Yep, yeah. and uh, tell them the, the, the date and time, and I'm yeah. sure they're aware of it, but uh, just crossing our T's, dotting our I's. Okay, sure, yeah. Anything else, Blake? I'm good. Okay, I'd like to move to grant permission for the Run Around the Mountain Veterans Day Road Race to be held on November 11th, 2024 at 10 a.m. as outlined with the course description and additional information provided in the flyer from John Reno. Second, any further discussion? No. Nope. Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thanks, John. Great, thank you very much. And it's good success for the race. All right, um, is Chris done here? No. Um, why don't we move ahead to, can we Alex. do Valerie? Yeah. Valerie um, Bird, are you ready to speak about your proposal? I'm sorry, I just had to run downstairs and get my iPad. Um, so, well, I'm looking at streamlining the mobile food application. So the way we're doing it now is extremely cumbersome for Pat, who does the permitting, and all the other town, all the other um, people, the Deerfield Academy. They they have uh, food trucks. Treehouse, Berkshire Brewery, um, Eagle Brook, and Yankee Candle. They all have food trucks. So when a food truck comes in, 
They get a one day permit. Well, first of all, they pay for an annual. So what we've been doing is we've been charging um, $150 for Treehouse and Berkshire Brewery food trucks only. The others pay $200, but then they have to pay another $50. So with the Treehouse and the Berkshire Brewery, if you recall, we have an agreement with them. Um, Casey, do you have a copy of that signed agreement for the board? I don't, but I did look okay. it up. There's two okay. agreements. There's a treehouse so, agreement and a BBC agreement. Right. So um, the way it was situated was I go and I do the inspections. I write up the reports. And then at the end of the month, I compile all the reports, make copies, give them to Pat with an invoice, and she sends it off to either Treehouse or Berkshire Brewery. So that, that's very time consuming. And then Treehouse is supposed to pay and Berkshire Brewery as well. So Treehouse has not paid their bill yet. As far as I know, I didn't check today, but I believe it's in, in process. And they in turn are turning around and charging the food vendors, which doesn't make sense at all because that's just adding another step. So the, the agreement was supposed to do away with the $50 for the food vendor and Treehouse was supposed to pay it not turn around and collect it from the food vendors. So what we're looking at doing is eliminating the per event fee, the $50 per food truck. We'll just charge them all 200, the annual fee, like the other towns, and you have a list of what the other towns are charging, which is less, way less than that. Nobody charges a per event fee, um, only Deerfield. And I understand that the reasoning was that you wanted to, or the board wanted to, cover our expenses. Well, there are, really aren't any additional expenses because I do the food trucks and then I do something else in between. Okay, um, I think we understand what your position is on this and uh, I know that previous previous Board of Health had had, had a different mindset about this. I think that you've made a good point about streamlining and uh, and making uh, removing uh, removing a step that seems somewhat redundant um, I know that the fire department has a similar annual fee for inspections of uh, propane tanks um, right and so um, I, I myself think this is a good proposal and uh, you know defer to Blake to see what he has to say about it well, after talking to Valerie, I think it's a good idea too because nobody else charges that $50 fee. The vendor comes in, he has a bad night, he's paying out 50 bucks every time he comes into town. And, you know, the, and the fire department does charge a fee as well. So I think with, with us just doing the annual fee would make a difference in, in trucks coming into town. If they know they've got to do the, the annual fee, they're still going to be inspected. And obviously, right. if there's violations, they will be handled accordingly. So I'm in agreement with this, that we do the 200, because when you're looking at the other towns, the ne one next to us is Northampton, pays a, they pay 150 annual. So we're $50 over them, and none of them pay a fee every time a truck comes into town. That's so correct. I'm in agreement with this. Yeah, and um, I think that uh, as long as we're doing the individual food inspections, which you, you, you work into your regular work schedule um, uh, by being a good planner of time, um, there's no impact on, uh, you know, the town, no negative impact on the town for this. So um, I would, uh, let's see, that's you, right? I would, I would like to make that effective September 1st. Yep. Yeah. Is that enough time to, to enact this, Casey? Or would you prefer October 1st or um, some I other had date? Asked, I had asked Valerie about that. Valerie, I think we would just want to confirm, this is just a thought, we would want to confirm that we receive the payments that are outstanding from any of the establishments that have we have an agreement with. And this being the case, September, I think it's reasonable to make the change just because I do know that it's been it's been 
something that's been questioned for quite some time. Um, from our perspective, it will streamline what Pat has to do. She won't have to do additional billings. Um, and then what we would want to do is just make sure, I think, Valerie, that we set the annual permit up, the structure up, so that it's ready to go when we have new vendors that come into town, right? Right, right. I left um, the board a note in their motions to confirm that you and Pat would work through whatever the process is to make sure that's in place as of September. Do you think the two of you can do that? I believe we could. We could actually work on this on Friday because I know Pat is leaving to go on vacation. Yeah. So I, I would get this in, in, in before she leaves. Okay. So the only question I would have about that is... Um, I don't know what food truck activity is in the winter. I guess probably with Deerfield Academy and, and uh, Eagle Brook in session, there would be food trucks. But um, how are we going to manage the, if we make it effective September 1, does that mean we're going from se September 1 to August 31st and then starting over again? Or would it be, make more sense no. to? September 1st. And most of the other, most of the food trucks already have their annual, the ones that come here, they already have their annual. Okay. So we would start, if anybody new comes in town, it would be September 1st to December 31st. And then we start over again in January. And Treehouse does have food trucks throughout the winter. We had food trucks Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Yep. Which is surprising, but it I guess it depends on how much snow. Is, is out there and uh, how much people want to go outside to eat. Valerie, is that for an event? Are they doing it for the people inside there? Or is it for the employees? No, it, it, it's for the public. They, they, do, they do food trucks for the public. Yeah. Okay. So, Valerie, do you think we should make the change in policy reducing the, eliminating the inspection fees effective September 1st, and maybe change yes. the annual to December 1st? Or uh, um, December, December 1st. January 1st? Right, right, we'll do the annuals for January, actually January 1st. They'll have their new, okay, uh, so they'll have, you know, they'll have their new permit as of January 1st. So it'll be on the calendar year. Right. So it would be. Sometimes we put regulations in place as, as necessary. Valerie and I did this with Chris Nolan's help last year when we changed the tobacco regulations. Right. Um, so eliminate the individual inspection fee as of September 1st and right. make the new annual fee effective January 1st. Correct. So that means my motion isn't <coughs> written correctly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, Tim. Well, no, we can, we can handle that. Um. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's just uh, wanted to make sure that uh, we didn't create, you know, a, a headache for, you know, if everyone starts on, on January 1, even if they get their annual done in March or whatever, um, we won't be running into a situation okay. of yes, having to track you. these I'm things. I'm sorry, I didn't think that one no, through good. the same way. You, you're making them, okay. you're making changes to that, so. No, what's the, no, what's so, the individual inspection fees is going to be effective September 1. Yep. Correct. That's still, that's still there, right? Yep. And the annual is January, is, is a January 1, 2025. Right. So. Right. So, so, so we'll bill them on August 31st for August, any food trucks they had in August. Berkshire Brewery, Brewery has only had just a few, but, but they have paid, their, they paid right away. It's just Treehouse oh, it was questioning it. Why are they paying for the food vendors? And I said, did send out an email to, to Casey. Um, that, that, that was my conversation with uh, Ryan last Saturday. Um, he was questioning, well, actually, he was looking to see who else had their annuals because during the half marathon, they're expecting to have 10 food trucks. Great, so um, you ready to make a motion, Blake? I hope so. <laughs> Do you want so, me here? Hold on. I think I got it. Yep. All right. Uh, so we're going to uh, move to approve the recommendation from Health Agent Valerie Bird to increase the annual mobile food service fee to two hundred dollars, effective January first, twenty twenty-five. Correct. Yes. Okay. And eliminate individual inspection fees 
for each mobile food, uh, food service vendor each time the unit serves in the town of Deerfield. And that'll be effective September 1st, 2024. Correct. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmar, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you, Valerie, for helping us out with this. Okay, so I do have um, one more thing. Um, you had asked about the tobacco, the, the tobacco regulations. Yes. And I had written to uh, Meredith O'Leary, who was in charge of the Tobacco Coalition out of Northampton, but she had just responded yesterday on that, and sh she's reviewing our regulations and the changes to see what changes we need to make. Is that correct, Casey? Yes, it is. I sent yeah. her to assist Valerie with that conversation with Meredith. I sent Meredith the um, Word document that Chris Nolan had used to develop what was voted on last year by the select board. So what Meredith, I think, is going to do is she's going to address that and make changes and send it back to us. Right, Valerie? Correct. Okay. And we'll give it to the board. Then we'll have to hold a hearing to handle it, to take yeah. care of it. And yeah. you'll have to tell them when you want it to be effective, Valerie, when we get there. Right. Right. So we'll, we'll see what the changes are first. Yeah. Um, and then go from there. If it's, if it's very minor changes, I think it, what I could see, there was only two. But we'll see what else she comes up with because it, it's, it's uh, not exactly easy reading. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, so we'll wait and hear. Probably be able to report next week back to the board and find out what Meredith actually um, says on that. Okay. Okay. So so we'll put that on for the agenda uh, for the next meeting. What in, in two weeks? Yeah, or or whenever you're ready to present it. Yeah. Um, okay, that, that'll be good. And have you had a chance to drive by ninety one ninety seven Stillwater? I personally haven't, but neither have I. Okay, but we understand I, you're making I would encourage you to just do a drive by. They're making significant progress. Wonderful. He's gone through 30 dumpsters and two pieces of equipment seven days a week. They're out there working on it. Wow. A lot of years of things to work through. Yes, I know. There's all layer right, so upon layer out there. Yeah, I guess that's all I have unless you have any questions. No, I think I'm, I'm good. good. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, have, a good, have a good night. You too. <coughs> you, Chris. All right. Yep. Christopher. So, um, yeah, I texted him. So, all right, Christopher, you ready to present? Sure. Just have a few updates for the board. Um, so one, I think uh, we've got a motion uh, for the board to make. Uh, so as previously mentioned, the MVP action grant for the Bloody Brook uh, hydrologic and hydrologic, I think I've got that right, <laughs> hydraulic and hydrologic study uh, was awarded to the town of Deerfield. Uh, so that's $170,000 in change. Um, at this point, we're just uh, signing a grant agreement with the state um, and then the actual contracts with uh, consultants will come in a few weeks. Um, so. Happy to answer any questions on that front, uh, but I believe Casey has a motion for the board to make to approve that. So, um, this is money that's from a grant, Chris? It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a state grant and it's to study the Bloody Brook watershed to give us information about making decisions about where water enters uh, into the downtown area and, and uh, anywhere where the Bloody Brook flows and then also give us information about how to make decisions on culvert replacements, et cetera. Uh, and there'll be a public education component, I understand. And anything else, Chris? Yeah, there'll be a couple of public meetings on this, um, as well as a, a meeting targeted specifically at uh, property owners who are seniors. And, and Jen Remillard from our senior center is gonna help out with that. Um, and then one other thing I would just mention is that you know part of the end goal here is we're gonna get some concepts for public infrastructure improvements um, so those might be culvert improvements or they might be improvements to sidewalks, you know, forest pavement, things like that. Um, so that'll be kind of the end goal of the project is getting those concepts for different improvements we can make to better weather the, the inland flooding that we're seeing from the Blight Brook. <clears throat> any, any other questions for him, Blake? Or? No, I think we're good. Now, this isn't an engineering thing. This is just basically a study 
that's going to move us towards, if we need to, an engineer to come in and and uh, work on the culverts and maybe the uh, the way that the the brook flows, that type of thing. Right. Yep. They'll do uh, basically <laughs> modeling through that that study, um, and then you know we'll get concepts, but it probably won't get into the point of actually having something engineered. If it, I mean, if it was a culvert, there would be so much permitting around that anyway that we probably wouldn't. Uh, be able to fit that into this project. Uh, but yeah, we'll get concepts out of this. Okay, thank you. So basically, there'll be scientists whose work is hydrolo hydraulic and hydrological um, studies of the way water passes through a geographic region. So those are the scientists, and then the data that they provide will inform you know, physical engineers who might be involved in designing culverts and so forth, and mitigation uh, for the for projects based on the data that's gathered by these scientists. So um, I move to approve the grant agreement between the town of Deerfield and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the amount of $170,300 for the FY25 EEA MVP program action grant for the Bloody Brook Resilience Hydrologic Hydraulic Modeling and authorize the town administrator to execute the contract effective August 15, 2024. I second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Ilchie, aye. Uh, next, Chris, you got other things you want to talk about? Or? Yeah, I just wanted to pro provide a quick update on the Leary lot. Um, so construction is proceeding nicely there. Um, so Tim and I actually were down at the site uh, on Tuesday. Um, they've completed you know, most of the sidewalks, uh, the perimeter of the parking area. And now they've kind of dug down, they're starting to put in the layers of aggregate that are going to underlie that forest pavement. Um, we were also talking with uh, Jeff Squire from Berkshire Design about the, the placement of one of the tree box filters that's funded by MVP for that, that project. Um, and I did want to mention that we got our first payment request uh, from Taylor Davis, the uh, general contractor. Um, so they had a few, there were some change orders that were agreed to between, um, you know, the town and the contractor and it's the overall uh, spread of that is that it's $17,000 in our favor. Um, so, you know, one thing that was identified was the original design had kind of a duplicative water line going to um, Elm Street um, and it was determined that really the one connecting to North Main would be sufficient for the project. Um, there was some additional tree removal that was needed that was identified um, and then you know we ultimately we also uh, found we needed a little less of the aggregate um, than what was originally identified in the design so ultimately um, you know they, they've uh, submitted um, a payment request for four hundred seventeen thousand dollars that's going to be reimbursed out of the CFI grant from the federal government um, and the project is proceeding I do have uh, field report if, if anyone wants to take a look at some photos of the site there's not too many and, and Tim I know you probably got some better shots uh, when you were on the site at Tuesday but uh, I would just say yeah things are moving along nicely there yep they're starting to um, also install some of the um, rain garden elements that will help to absorb water from the surrounding area too so all right Thank you. Chris is there a timeline on this as far yeah, as so construction should be wrapped up by October 1st. Um, the, the, the kind of challenge with the timeline has to do with um, the actual charging stations. So the level two charging stations are easily um, delivered within uh, just a couple weeks. Level three, there's more of a lag time. Um, so, you know, it's possible um, that'll have to, you know, to wait until spring. Um, we're still, obviously, we'd love to see it in this fall, um, and we're working with our OPM, River More Energy, to make sure that, you know, we're, we're keeping on our, um, our distributor as well as the utility, and it is really the utility is the, the, um, the snag here. Um, so, but we're going to try to get those installed uh, before the snow flies, so to speak. I know we had a conversation about the chargers. There how many over there now? Two or one? That's in the lot. Yeah, now. 
Yeah, there's just a couple of the, the level two charging. And so what this project would do is install level three. Um, so those, you know, just much faster, um, really could be as low as like a half hour to get your car charged up. Um, and then also some additional level two chargers. Um, and I think, I believe you had brought up last time that whether we were gonna be able to keep the existing level two and unfortunately it looks like we can't. Um, so that, that'll have to be, um, you know, that's, we're just gonna have level, new level two charging in there uh, instead. Um, so so the, that's the story with the charger. The old chargers are gonna be what, turned in or? They're going to go um, in replacement yeah, can, with these for these replacements. I can figure out if they're if that's even a possibility at this point, or if they're basically um, you know no longer no longer serviceable. Uh, I'll find out. We can get back to you on that one, Blake. Okay, thank you. So basically, we're going to get four new level two chargers in the in this phase of it, and potentially the the four level three chargers will be delayed because of equipment delays. Potentially, but we're, again, we're still working to try and make sure we get those uh, in time. Excellent. Um, and then just really quick related, uh, so on Elm Street, you might have seen some surveyors out there. Um, so Northeast Surveying has started their work. They're subcontracted with Ty and Bond to do our complete streets work on Elm Street. Um, so that's really the first step is get an actually good survey of Elm Street from railroad to Main Street. Um, so they, I know they were out there last week. Uh, and you may have seen them some this week as well. Um, so we should have pretty soon a deliverable from Time Bond that's actually a, a quality, up-to-date survey of that entire street uh, from railroad to Maine. Um, real quick, other infrastructure projects. Uh, shared streets, you might have seen up on North Main that the, the beacons are installed up there. I've been told by the contractor that the uh, crosswalks are going to be in very shortly. Um, and I know school is coming right up, so we definitely want to make sure that happens uh, quickly. Um, on the Mill Village, North Main, and 5 and 10 intersection, I'm not sure if everyone saw it, but MassDOT just sent over this week uh, a letter confirming that their project review committee has approved that project. Um, and so what that means is that intersection project now has a project number and can be publicly tracked. Um, so it is, it's project number 613-708. Um, so if you go to MassDOT's um, Highway Division project webpage, um, you can actually see cost estimates and who the project manager is and what stage the project is in. So it's, a, it's still early days, but it's a nice step forward for that, uh, for that intersection improvement. Um, and then one other thing I wanted to mention, so I've been working with uh, DDIC on one of their wish list items, which is an update to our overall economic development plan. Um, FERCOG has some funding from the USA Economic Development Administration that they can use to help us update the plan. Essentially, it would just be doing an inventory of what businesses there are in the industrial park. And then beyond that, I think including some of those um, items that I talked about previously that we're looking to fund uh, with a community one-stop grant, including the road connection between the Deerfield Industrial Park and the Waitman Industrial Park, um, and potentially a sewer connection to uh, Waitley. So basically at this point, you know, this plan would just be providing an overview of those projects. And ultimately, if it's gonna be an official update to that economic development plan, it would have to get approved by town meeting, but that would be something to, to look at in the future. Okay. So that's, that's all I have for the moment. Any questions on any of those? Just one quick on, on the North Main Street. Uh, mostly the sidewalk infrastructure down to Pleasant Street is taken care of, but um, uh, seating and so forth is been done um, is is that correct? It's basically a completed project at this point, or there are few yeah, details. Yeah, uh, as far as I can tell, the sidewalks are done. Um, there is, I think, a little area around one of the beacons that um, I have to talk to Chris Miller about to make sure that either Taylor Davis or Davenport is going to be um, completing the, a little bit of paving that has to happen there. Um, so. But the, the sidewalk project, I believe, is concluded in terms of work performed. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.
All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Um, so I have a, a few um, select board notes. Do you have any on your own, Blake, that you'd like to do? Yeah, it's just um, I've just got a couple of comments that I think as a board we need to, to look at at some point. Sure. Um, and one is um, the committees and the, uh, the different boards. I'm trying to make to, to get to the meetings and to see what they're going on, but I was wondering if we can maybe get them to come in and do a report on, a, on an occasion to up, update us on what they're doing, the projects they're up to, and that sort of thing. Only because I can't make every meeting, and I'd like to, you know, at least keep abreast of some of the things that are going on. And I didn't know if we could invite them to come into the meetings here to give us an update on on the different things that the boards and the uh, committees are doing. Well, one thing that we might do is invite you to the Connected Community Initiative meetings. That they're basically monthly, where pretty much every board has a representative um, come and discuss it. Um, that's one one avenue. Um, if you want to do that first, and then you know maybe we want to pick selected boards, have them come in. Um, I mean, we've been doing that for two years, so you know it's an effective tool for, and it's open to the public. And, and I see people visit that uh, meeting regularly, um, so I don't know. I'd have to check my calendar. I don't know if we scheduled one in September, but um, certainly we should look into that. Okay, I and, appreciate that. And, and something else you said? Uh, oh yeah, um, I've been talking to the chief about some of the other culverts in town because I've had people that have come up to complain and I'm gonna go out with him and then I'll report back to the board on the findings on those, those other culverts in the areas that uh, of concern. Um, the other thing is, which is the latest, which I know you're going to bring up, so it's, I, I'm just going to say that I want to comment on Treehouse, but I'll wait till you go with that and, sure, <laughs> and sure. I'll comment. Yeah, so um, uh, I was going to mention the MassDOT approval of some sort of traffic mitigation project at the Mill Village and the Greenfield Road Route 5 intersection. Um, and uh, that's exciting because I know it's been a point of concern. I want to thank uh, you know, uh, Wayne Manley and Patricia Taylor for spearheading a community effort to get MassDOT's attention on that uh, intersection. Um, Treehouse, uh, Blake and I went out with the police chief and the fire chief on August 12th to tour the complex uh, while there was a concert going on. and. Um, we looked at the back of the stage. Uh, we went through the building to look at the EMS and uh, safety structure that's in place. We don't have official decibel equipment, but we walked out toward um, the uh, property line towards Greenfield Road, and we were getting readings and the well, you can you can maybe did you have it or, or I was, didn't have them. We were that. getting readings in the 80 decibel to 85 decibel range, at, which is under what the allowable um, decibel level is there. But this is not an official. This is like a phone app. So um, the purpose of the meeting was to you know get a get an assessment of what can what can be done to help um you know address concerns of residents off you know north main street captain lathrop uh jackson street and uh see if there's a way that we can get treehouse to adjust the way they run their operations so that uh, noise was m a less of a problem for the residents um Casey, I think we spoke a little bit about um, a plan that we're also working with. Um, do you want to talk about that at all on the legal front? I think we're going to work with possibly the DEP and see if we can get some assistance from that front. But so I did, I have reached out to legal counsel um, on behalf of the board to sort of help refine my understanding of what is in front of everyone in terms of the noise complaints we've received. I have also forwarded those noise complaints to Treehouse. Um, they're aware of them, but there, there's potentially some progress that could be made by addressing having the Board of Health 
consider addressing noise issues through the DEP. Um, I don't know if it's a regulation, but the DEP level information, which is what you just mentioned. Um, and perhaps that would be to gather data using the official measuring tools. And I spoke to Valerie about this a couple weeks ago. And she was going to see if we could maybe borrow that from another municipality or another entity um, to get to get those get more official data, and then perhaps the board could approach it from the perspective of using that data and inviting both Treehouse and the people who are complaining about the noise or people interested in that and hearing about more about what's going on to come to a meeting and discuss that. Um, I think it, maybe getting the official data would be a good way to start. Valerie agreed with me. Um, in particular, that DEP piece of this goes through the board, the board of health, whereas the select board could approach it from a different perspective. So, but before I do too much in terms of saying what could or couldn't happen, I think the board it, it behooves the board to think about you know how you would like to approach it. You know, I'm thinking about it just from the wheelhouse of the TA's office, which is try to protect everybody and get, gather as much information as possible. Personally, I don't know how the board feels about that, feels about what you want to do. Right. I mean, I, I actually think that to the extent that it's possible to get independent research from DEP, I don't know if they provide that service. That's something you're going to have to investigate. I was going to see how I could figure that out. And that it, it, it's from an independent source, and so that... Um, I think makes probably everyone more comfortable about accepting the, the results. Um, I know that we talked with uh, the Treehouse uh, concert management team about some possibilities of, for the future. We didn't, they didn't make any commitments, but we were looking for things like, could we put noise dampening um, materials at the back of the concert stage? Could they potentially build a concert stage rather than renting one that would be more soundproof and would be better able to direct sound. One of the things that we did discover, and uh, we both went our separate ways at the end of this uh, gathering, and I think Blake might have gone to different parts of town than I did, just to try to hear what you could hear from different locations, is that sound is very dependent on things like bass level. Uh, if the bass is really you know, strong, you might hear things in your house differently than someone else. Um, if the humidity level is high, the sound might travel farther. Um, so we obviously know we have to do some information gathering. And um, I definitely want to have a public forum, you know, and invite Treehouse. And once we get some more research about um, this so that we can address, uh, I know that they have a, their final concert of the year, I believe, outdoors is September 14. It's in the school year, so um, we want people to be aware that this will be the last concert of the year, and between now and the, the beginning of the next outdoor season, we take steps to, to help address the situation. So Blake, you had some things you wanted to say. Yeah, so I had been out and about in the town, different locations where people have been complaining about the noise, and when you get there for one concert you can barely hear it you get there for another concert and it is very it's very loud so the other part of it is, is i just i on my way down tonight i spoke to somebody who was just in their yard they had not complained about it and i said did you hear the music the other night and this is uh on hillside and uh he said oh yeah he said uh he said you can hear it and it actually irritates you more in your house than it does outside and when he said that, it kind of made, it made sense to me because the noise level will disperse in, in an open area, whereas if it hits a confined area, it's con it'll stay concentrated or a little more concentrated. So we're learning as we go as to why, you know, what sound does and how it travels and the rest of it. And I think one of the things that I agree with Tim on is the fact that we need deadening curtains that need to be put not only on the stage but maybe even behind the stage so that it deadens the sound traveling towards north main street and then have them do maybe a natural barrier towards five and ten to 
dead in the sound going across the road there. And these are, these are just my opinions and just something I was looking at. It's, the board hasn't even, even, has, hasn't even looked into this, but it's something that I'm gonna bring, bring to the rest of the board so that we can come up with a solution for this because it, we have to do something with it relatively quickly. Yeah, and uh, the sound deadening that I was referring to was definitely behind the stage to dampen the, the sound traveling towards the residential. Uh, North Main Street is probably the closest residential neighborhood. Um, so if we can make a, a big difference there, it will go a long way toward, um, you know, making everybody a little more comfortable with the situation. Um, we have... Uh, I think we might have some potential, not necessarily discrepancies, but areas of unclear language in the entertainment zone legislation and um, the special permit legislation that was approved by the ZBA, et cetera. So these are all things that Casey's going to be taking to the, the legal uh, team to try and get us a clearer picture. Um, the uh, final thing I want to talk about is um, the uh, <clears throat> Valley Health Regional Cooperative that uh, Board of Health is involved in uh, just wants, they're, they're going to be issuing some advice to uh, the superintendent and uh, school um, principals about the upcoming flu RSV uh, season just in, just to, you know, get a uh, game plan in place for students as they go back to school. Um, but um, Megan Tudrin is the person, the nurse that's uh, sort of helping to run that group, um, Deerfield resident, I believe. And uh, so that's, that's moving forward. So next thing on the agenda is um, Discussion about um, Sunny Days, Inc., which is a, it's a marijuana um, production and uh, sales facility that's being developed on Route 5, um, just south of the treehouse area, uh, probably right across from the South County EMS, roughly. Um, they, the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission is change the rules regarding um, host community agreements, which is what we're looking at. So Sunny Days has asked us to update our agreement with them. Um, we have had our legal counsel working on that. Um, this is the only group out of the three licenses that we had at our disposal who has actually moved forward with actually building a facility. Um, so. Uh, based on the recommendations of um, our legal team, we made changes to conform to the new regulations that the Cannabis Control Commission has put in place. And um, we are looking to, uh, they have to go before the Cannabis C Control Commission on a yearly basis to renew their license. They're not actually anywhere near growing any marijuana or selling any marijuana products at this facility but they have put in the foundations and they, sh they believe that they will have their facility exterior fully buttoned up by winter uh, before the snow flies, so late October, early November. And uh, so uh, we're, we've reviewed the documents and I think, uh, you know, Blake, do you have any thoughts about that? I just think this is housekeeping and it's something that we have to address because the CCC has changed hands a few times and I think that they're updating their, the CMRs and that sort of thing. So I think we have to fall in line with that and uh, make sure that we, we end up with uh, something that's it, what the, the CCC is looking for. Right, it's got to conform. And um, the, old, the old host community agreement had a, one of the things that the state initially allowed communities to do was to negotiate a, a 3% of revenue agreement, which meant that we could offset any costs that we might incur because of police, necessary police or 
public safety uh, or fire or any of that uh, response to the locations. Um, but the CCC has pretty much changed that, and I'm not a legal expert, so I can't explain exactly what it is, but um, there, there's no advantage to us trying to preserve that element of this because, um, you know, it's a major bookkeeping headache, and then you have to provide all kinds of documentation about, uh, you know, whether there was a police call or an EMS call or so forth. So, um, I think it, as Blake says, it's more of a housekeeping thing. It retains a lot of the things that we were concerned about, like a water control system, because that's the, the place, uh, you know, make sure they're not putting water from their grow facility out, and pretty much they don't. All the water that they use there stays within or evaporates. The other major consideration was we wanted to have a, an odor control system there that, so that neighbors, thankfully there are not many neighbors right there, but that, that this wouldn't be a problem for residents. So those elements, I believe. Is there anything else in it that we, we retained? Um, I don't think so. I think basic it was, basically it was adding the elements that were pertinent to Deerfield, which was odor control, security, wastewater, aff wastewater um, affluent. Those were the things that were particular to the town. And Sunny Days was amenable to adding that language into the template format itself. Right, and those have been previously included in the original host, host community agreement, but the, the Cannabis Control Commission gave a streamlined guideline for what a host community agreement should be under the new regulations, and uh, we augmented with the things that we thought were pertinent to Deerfield. Yes. So if there's no other, uh, I'll make a motion to approve the host community agreement between the town of Deerfield and Sunny Days, Inc. as presented and subject to final amendments by council and have the members sign at their convenience. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. So what that means is there are a few words that need to be tweaked in this agreement and dates have to be inserted into it, but once our legal team is okay with it, then um, the select board members will sign. Okay, um, okay, next up is um, a discussion of the horse burial off of Kelleher Drive. Um, we've had several meetings at which this topic came up, and I think the horse has been buried for about three months now. Um, so our, we have done our research with our legal team and with the experts that we were able to consult. We've uh, written a couple of letters, one, one of which will go to the person who buried the horse and one of which will go to the neighbors in the area. Uh, and we have two separate letters. Um, I'm going to make a motion to approve a letter for the Deerfield Board of Health to Martha Price regarding the lack of adherence to agricultural guidelines for the burial of a horse on her property as presented. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. And I move to approve a letter from the select board detailing the circumstances of the lack of adherence to agricultural guidelines, burial of a horse at Fort Kelleher Drive as presented. Second. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Those uh, letters will be available, they're public record. And they're also going to be mailed to the, uh, as I said, the residents. File. Yeah, we, we have to sign them, and then once that's taken place, we can sign them at the end of the meeting. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. So do you want to talk about the Weston and Sampson? Uh, I can talk about it, yes. Thank I, you. So as you know, there's been some concern about two spots on River Road where the slope seems to be degrading. Um, particularly since in one spot there was work done just around 10 years ago to um, support that area. Um, so what Chris Miller, the interim superintendent, did was he, oh yeah, lights. I didn't turn the lights on. I'm sorry. <laughs> so what Chris Miller did was he reached out to Weston and Sampson Engineers, which is affectionately now known as WSE, and had them come out and look at the area and provide us with a proposal for a scope that would be essentially to evaluate those two spots 
and provide information on alternatives that the town could use to deal with the problems. It is not engineering design. It is simply an evaluation and recommendation to address it. Um, the cost of that contract is 25700 I believe. Um, and so I have the proposal in front of you. I provided you with that so you could see what areas you're looking at and ba what the basic scope is. Um, my Generally, I recommend to the select board and to other entities that we use draft town contracts to address these things. You only see Weston and Sampson's proposal because both Chris Miller and I thought you should see that first before we reached back out to them to see if they were interested in, in working on a contract with us. So if the board's amenable to proceeding, and I did give you a motion, if the board's amenable to that, then I would, with your direction, I would send WSE a town contract and incorporate the proposal into our contract and negotiate that with town council. So my question on this is that is this is just for this play, the area of Beaver Drive and further down where the cones and the barrels are. It's I if, believe it's for the spot and well I can't shouldn't say the address. I think it's, it's one of the spots is 55 yeah. River Road and I don't remember the other one. But for anybody that There's has driven down the road, yeah. they've seen pretty much where those cones and those barrels are. I so. believe so. And uh, again, with this study, is that something that can be used in the future to other areas of not necessarily even River Road, but Stillwater, if they have something where it looks like we've got some sort of a situation going where the, the road is undermined or there might be an issue with that? Um, it can not it be used for that or not? No. It isn't necessarily a study. What it is is it's specific to, to those two slope degrading er those two areas where the slope's degrading okay. on River Road, um, and it would be particularly to figure out what the town could, what resources we might need to proceed with an alternative to fix it. That's really it's really driving driving to the two details in those two areas, which, as you mentioned, are. Um, at the intersection with Beaver Drive on River Road and then a little bit further north of that, near 51 River Road. So there's, there was some work done in many years ago and we need to see what, what's degrading the slope there because it's been significant in the last several years. Right. So as this proposal mentions, um, there was road reconstruction done in that, roughly in that area in November of 2000, September and November of 2014. Yes. Um, recent storm events and subsidence uh, possibly related to the riverbank, um, you know, has occurred. So um, we can't make a fix unless an engineer tells us what's wrong with it. and. Uh, Am I correct that this this is money that would be um, there's a, a contract is for what twenty seven or twenty five thousand seven hundred dollars? Yes. And this is uh, to be paid for through state chapter ninety. Correct. Money. This is an allowable expense through chapter ninety, and um, superintendent inter, interim superintendent Miller has explored that option, and it's allowable, so we can do it through there. Mm -hmm. And um, so our our major concern. Concerns are too well. We would approve the contract, but we want to put it into a, a town contract, correct? So that we have all of our usual protections yes. in place. And generally, with an engineering or architectural firm, there there's a back and forth between the town and their their council to refine those terms. But it it does offer some more protections than a, a regular proposal mm -hmm. for the town. I'm good. You okay? You yeah. want to? Move to approve River Road Slope Geotechnical Services from Weston and Sampson Engineers for $25,700 and incorporate the proposal into a Town of Deerfield contract template subject to Town Council adjustments to complete an agreement. 
and have the select board chair sign at his convenience. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you. Okay. I will let Chris Miller know. Okay. Um, and it looks like the last action item tonight, other than the mail, is um, something you'll take us through, Casey? Yes. So there's a couple of things. Um, I provided, on Monday evening, I provided the personnel board. And this is item, hold on, I don't have the packet in front of me, but, well, I don't have that portion of the packet in front of me. Um, this is under the Employment and Other Policies placeholder. So. On Monday evening with the personnel board, I provided three draft policies for them to start to consider. Um, the first one was the draft ADA statement. There was a draft attendance policy and a draft con conflict of interest policy. And I advised them that we could expect some comments from town council, but that these are policies that were recommended during the study of our bylaw and consideration of a manual and we should be placing some type of language around these things into our policy manual now that it's effective. So what I've tried to do after hearing concerns from a member of the select board is make sure that whatever policies I send to the personnel board, I also send to the select board within a reasonably short period of time. So since you had meetings the same week, I thought I should give them to you at the same time. These aren't, I, what you see there is the comments that actually came out of the personnel board meeting. So they had some comments around some of the language and I tried to put those in. So you can review that. It will come back to you after they look at it again at their next meeting. So I just, this is a sort of first read situation where you see that there's something that's been drafted and you have time to digest it. Um, the second portion of that particular um, bullet box is a request for two temporary pay adjustments and a stipend for approval by the select board. And essentially we have, um, we've done this in the past, um, there's a situation where we've had to work without a couple of people in different departments that have required folks in those offices to increase the workload or have had an impact on the workflow for particular positions. And I'm requesting two things, that the select board approve a temporary pay adjustment for Pat Kroll in the administration office um, until the incoming assistant town administrator is fully onboarded into his position, which would hopefully be done by October, I would think and also approve a temporary pay adjustment for the admin in the public works department um, due to the similar situation where her workload has changed due to the retirement of uh, Superintendent Scarborough. Uh, was it a month ago? Oh my gosh, it was a month ago. So in both cases, you've had some changes to the, res the workflow but I think it would be a good idea to recognize that these folks have taken on duties that they didn't anticipate having to do and for a, for a reasonable period of time. Um, and then the third thing is a stipend towards one of our administrative assistants um, furthering, her, furthering her education. Um, Amy Hahn has matriculated into the Mass Municipal Association Suffolk University Certificate Program for Local Government Leadership and Management. Um, this wasn't contemplated in the budget, but the modules that she will be working through, and it's a two semester program, so it goes, I shouldn't say two semesters, it's essentially a nine, a, it's a program that goes through two official semesters that you would see like in a college semester situation. Um, so she'll be going through from September this year to May of next year. And it's a, it's a program that will help enhance her ability to perform the work that she does, particularly supporting a lot of the 
committee she works with and understanding better how the foundation of legal, the legal foundation of local government is in relation to what all of us have to do, as well as the legal ramifications of some of the decision making that happens for the committee she supports. So I looked through some of the information that she provided to me and I made a recommendation to approve a stipend of a portion of the total, um, and that was $1,680. But the total cost of the program is $2,800, and she's already paid that herself. So it's up to the board how you want to address that part. I do have motions for it, but if you want to look at it from, I look at it from the perspective of management, which is, you know, what's the benefit right this second um, based on this particular activity, but it's up to the board. It's you guys that make the decision. I just make sure it gets implemented. So those are my requests to help facilitate operations in all of those areas. So, so after what you said, my understanding is that uh, um, with Pat Kroll and uh, with um, Diane Cornwell, Diane Cornwell, that uh, this is temporary. In other words, when Correct. the new assistant town administrator comes on board, then Pat goes back to a regular thing. And when we hire a new highway superintendent, then she will go back as as Ho well. So hopefully, there would be that adjustment period right. would be short. Um, but also keep in mind that they are down other staff in the public works department yep. so there's a different there's a different breadth of work that's happening for Diane got it so just briefly um, the personnel uh, policies that uh, you referenced there as, as people will remember at the town meeting we uh, decided to move from a full bylaw uh, where we had no local control over rewriting personnel guidelines to having a bylaw and then having a, a personnel regulation that we could adjust as we need to, to to meet local conditions. So these are elements like like American Americans with Disability Act is one of the policies we're talking about. So it's a very standard thing. And then a policy on employee attendance and a policy on conflict of interest law. So um, those are all pretty standard things that should be in a personnel guideline uh, regulation. Yes. Um, and with regard to um, the, uh, the, the things we're talking about, the temporary stipends, um, <clears throat> I fully support the idea of um, recognizing people who are doing extra work um, when a, an unforeseen circumstance like uh, we lost our assistant town administrator at the beginning of July. And so a lot of this work has been dispersed among the remaining staff and it's landed more heavily on Pat. So, um, you know, as, as Casey mentions, this is a temporary, a temporary adjustment and it would be paid for through um, the savings that we're having, not having the assistant town administrator. So it's not, um, it's, it's not going to increase or we won't have to look for transfer because it's within the administrative staff budget. Um, in the same way that um, the temporary pay increase for Diane Cornwell will be handled through the DPW's administrative staff budget. Um, Kevin Scarborough was, uh, was be paid at a higher rate, so um, there's money to, to pay these temporary stipends. Um, and the final part of this is that, as you under explained it to me, there are five courses that Amy Hahn is taking in this, in this first session of... In the, in the entire <laughs> session itself. From September through May, she will be taking five modules. Right, and three of them have direct applicable uh, applicability to her, to, position. to her, and will help her become a more effective employee. So, um, the other two could be could certainly, having contemplated and been in, been enrolled in that class itself. I was enrolled many years ago, but I was unable to attend due to a staffing change here in the office. Um, the other two modules won't hurt. They will be helpful in her career. Um, it's just as, as it stands in the position, um, it isn't necessarily a part that, could, that that person could be expected to address. Okay, so for discussion, I'll make a motion to approve a temporary pay adjustment for Patricia Kroll 
increasing her rate to $31.79 per hour, effective July 1, 2024, until the incoming assistant town administrator is fully onboarded into this position. Second. Um, so for purposes of discussion, we expect um, the, new, the new person, Greg Snedeker, will be joining us September 9th. September 9th. And um, he is very familiar with, he's a select board member in Gill. Uh, he's worked for FERCOG for a number of years on the council. Um, so we expect him to be up to speed relatively quickly, but uh, there'll be a lot of interaction between uh, Pat and himself as he gets all of his duties and, and uh, assignments in place and under control. So any thoughts on that, Blake? I think you've, you've covered it and that's, that's fine. Okay, so um, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Over to you, Blake. Okay. So I move to approve a temporary pay adjustment for Diane Cornwell, increasing her rate from $26.08 per hour, uh, effective July 1st, 2024, until a permanent superintendent is hired. Um, and I'll second that. And uh, again, um, I think Kevin was used to handling uh, uh, some of the administrative functions and sharing the load with Diane. Um, Chris Miller is in a situation where he doesn't have he doesn't have a replacement for himself at this point. So he's doing what Kevin and he used to do on the physical side of this operation. And so some of the uh, he's had to push down some of the duties that Kevin used to perform to Diane. So he's, he's had to get some help, sort of. Yeah, some of that administrative, and he's work probably though. probably tapped into Brenda and yes. various other members of staff to to try and. We're uh, doing our best to make sure that we support him so that things the operations continue. But Diane's taking a good deal of that load, and we appreciate all her hard work, just like we appreciate what Amy and Pat are doing. Do you have any thoughts, Blake? No, I think we're good with that as well. I I, I watched Kevin when I came on board and watch what he was doing as well. And like I said, Chris was in and out of the office. He was doing some of the paperwork, but I don't think he has the time to do as much as what Kevin was doing. So I agree that we need to give um, Diane a little bit of a boost because she is doing uh, a lot more than she was before. Okay, so if there's no further discussion, uh, all those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. And finally. So, I <laughs> move to approve a stipend of $1,680 for Amy Hahn to pay a portion of the costs for the Mass Municipal Association Suffolk University Certificate in Local Government Leadership and Management Program. Second. So I think we talked that pretty well through, but do you have any further questions? Yeah, for I just Casey? said Amy is working for all of the inspectors and she's also working for what she committees? She works, she's the main support staff for planning, zoning, and con con. Yeah, so, so she she's, does a she's, huge amount of work. She plays a big role in what we're doing here, and I think this would give her some guidance further along for, um, you know, as far as the office goes, as well as working with the committees. Yeah, building the knowledge base and certainly a, a greater understanding of where all these things fit in the greater whole. Yep, and uh, yeah, she does. Um, an amazing amount of um, filings, conservation commission buildings, all of them have copious uh, state requirements for filling out forms and triplicate and making sure they get to everybody. She's very helpful to the, the, the local builder community because um, they're not always familiar with the paperwork that they need to fill out. And uh, so she helps them and she identifies problems in their paperwork so that they can you know, keep their professional lights on track as they try to comply with state and local regulations. So um, I think, um, you know, public education that will further her ability to serve the public is a good thing. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you. So um, we have, I think, one set of minutes tonight, right? We actually, I looked at them and we were missing some content and I talked to, Pat had done them and I give her a lot of credit. It was a lot to wade through. Um, there was some, she had made some revisions. And okay, so they're not ready to be looked they, at? Yeah, they weren't ready. And she finished, she was able to regurgitate what she is. There was sort of some 
different version she was looking at. So okay. She sent them to me, but I'd never chance to finish them. So that's why you drew a line through that That's minutes. why I drew a line okay. through it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 and I scribbled it so you can barely... Yeah, I couldn't remember if that was me it. or if that was you, so... Okay, that makes it clear. Yeah, so um, the, there are a couple of places where I just... If I didn't... Because I was hoping we would have those minutes done, but I realized that there was something wrong with them, so she and I talked about it, but we'll get them to you for the next meeting. Okay. Um, and she's also working on additional versions we are still struggling to get through these minutes in an effective way because although the ai piece is great for us now that it's on the zoom ai going back and trying to find ways to summarize things very quickly is still a challenge she and i are still working on that amy's been incredibly helpful too um because amy started doing the initial research to go through that Mm -hmm. um, so I just have a few things I want to follow up with the board about. Do you um, want to do the mail first? Yeah, go through okay. the mail. There's That's what I was going to say. There's okay. one thing in the mail. So there's a, a several things in the mail, but there's one additional thing that isn't on the list, and that was a notification I received from Mike Kane at Eversource um, about vegetation surveying that's going on. It. And so it's, on, it's in your packet. It's just not in the list. So what area is that going to affect? Do you remember? Um, it is the flyovers. So that would be the high tension wires? Yeah, it's yeah. near the high tension lines. Um, That's something that they do on a regular basis. Yeah, it's a basically a year lease. Yeah, five years anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it plays into how their vegetation management plan, management plan yep. happens. There's also a letter that I received from a different member of the team at Eversource. Um, they have to do some work near a particular resident's house. So they s notify the town as well as the resident that this is going to happen. So I just included that information for you as well. Right. Um, yeah, because that is actual ve vegetation work as opposed to, you know, future vegetation right. work. So As opposed to evaluating what's necessary. So we also have a letter from um, FERCOG, um, Jessica Atwood, who's um, handling this... Uh, National Interest Electric Transmission Corridor process that uh, is going on in place, and it's a um, proposal to have a 60 or 70 mile uh, corridor from the New York border to essentially where the Northfield Hydroelectric uh, Station is. And um, the proposal itself talks about a, a mile wide corridor, but um, I've attended several of the meetings that are involved in this process to give you know a local perspective on this as as well as many select board members and uh, from the the region uh, that's affected by this. And um, Eversource also is pushing back, saying we don't need a mile wide wide corridor. We need you know a, a corridor that's wide enough to allow us to to address the needs of yes. you know taking care of the transmission lines. A concern that we have is. You know, a mile wide corridor could this would this would take away any local input into decisions that would be made in that mile wide corridor. So um, the federal government could unilaterally decide to do something there that was related tangentially to you know electric transmission, and suddenly you'd have something you'd never contemplated there. So um, it's a process, and uh, we appreciate the FERCOG's help on this. Well, and it it looks like there's quite a dis difference between what they have now and what. Eversource is looking for, which is a 200 to 300 foot. Exactly. Width, as opposed to a mile width. Yeah, and uh, that's quite a quite a bit of acreage to oh, reduction. I mean, yeah. currently it's a standard. I, in my conservation commission days, we would go out and basically it was a two to 300 foot, right. you know, corridor that you know seems perfectly logical to have. Um, so this is a process that's in i think it's it's in a second phase and it will continue to be reviewed and i'm and comment will be sought from you that's know our our local legislators as well as that's uh, why i provided that information yep. because we got information separately from eversource information through jessica's um report and it's essentially two different slide decks really but it's it's going to play out over a period of time, and so I think keeping everybody up to date would be useful. So when I do get those things, I, it's just like me sending you DPU information mm -hmm. with filings. It's just trying to keep everybody up to date with things that they could see coming across their email at some point. 
Yep. Um, and in many cases, you know, I've mentioned this before in other meetings, a lot of times I will share information about what I'm doing um, with the board via blind carbon copy so they know that there's certain topics that are on my radar screen throughout the week. Um, and so to the extent that, you know, these things could be of concern or interest to the public, they're, not everything makes it into the mail, but these were things I thought should be there. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and sorry, now you can go on to your... No, I, that was a good, no, it, it allowed me to remind myself about why I put those things in there. Um, so for purposes of what's been happening in the office, there's been a lot of work done on some legal questions that were going on. Um, I've been working with, on several tasks with some of the department heads and some of the committee chairs. There's some work that we need to support um, community preservation and capital on as we get closer towards the closure of a special town meeting warrant. Um, I'm thinking that we had a closure date of the 30th. Um, the board, I may ask the board if they can meet briefly next week, although I don't anticipate it because you really wouldn't need to see a warrant until it's, I've got final, sort of a final understanding of what's been requested, but we have at least one capital request right now. Two, actually two capital requests right now. So I've been trying to follow up on those things. I've got some questions out to Synaxo about the trust repairs. We have a second pay application that's come forward that's been approved by the engineer. Um, but I was trying to get some more information on sort of what they're in the middle of in terms of repairs. Um, I know people are complaining about the clock. So I did ask Sean over at Synaxo. I think they had to disconnect the clock because they're doing the repairs, but I asked him to confirm that. Um, and I'm sorry that the clock isn't working. <laughs> I feel really bad. Uh, but we do need to get that truss repaired because that's what's keeping the roof up. Um, so there's been a lot of work around procurement that's going on. We've got several things that are going to come across our desks, like Christopher mentioned earlier. This hydrologic study is going to end up coming across from a procurement perspective. Um, and we're trying to get a handle on what may be upcoming for fall and winter. Right now, as you know, earlier, a few weeks ago, I shouldn't say earlier, but a few weeks ago, we asked if um, the select board would approve confirming that the interim superintendent signs contracts for highway work that the COG does. So he'll be dealing with those things um, because you've got they have a schedule of things that they do and they're, they're about to hit another really busy point. So I'm trying to work with them on a couple of background stuff that some of the committees need help with. Um, Before you slide off on that, um, I did, I think we spoke about having um, uh, interim chief Miller come in and give yes. us an update on um, a timeline of work projects he has planned between now and mid, you know, mid fall mid-autumn or, or early uh, early November um, so just let us know when that can be taken yeah, care of. Yeah, so I, I, have, I have a meeting with him tomorrow. Um, he wasn't able to come in and speak to me yesterday or today because he was out on job sites. Yep. Um, so what I'll do is I will ask him if he could, if we could set that up, would you like to do that for the next meeting? If he's, if he's available, yeah, that would be good because I know some residents, particularly on Graves and Eastern and, and Cross, are interested in Especially the timeline. In that, yes. And yes. also about the, the, the swale um, work that we need to do along that corridor. So, you know, um, just want to get the residents uh, a rough timeline of when that's going to occur. And we had initially, he and I had talked about that once before, but I will ask him. Um, to give me an idea and see if he can come in and talk to the board. That might be a good way to just sort of... Solidify things. Yes. Yep. Yes. And we can put him early in the meeting, so... Yes. Because I... It, just like we would do it with Kevin. Normally when I set those up, I try to get, you know, staff members in and out if yep. we can. Um, because they've already worked a pretty long day by the time they get here. So one thing that came up... Um, is the townwide tag sale. And I thought I asked everybody about this, but 
Pat asked me about it this afternoon. So generally the townwide tag sale happens the first Saturday of October. And that's the 5th. Now, recall, we have special town meeting on the 7th, but I don't think that really has an intersect. Would the board be okay with us just con with, by confirming that townwide tag sale would be the 5th of, of October? First Saturday of the month. So it's happened for the, I don't know, probably, what, 10 years maybe or more? Um, but Pat just has gotten some calls and she'd like to be able to tell people, yes, it's confirmed. So if the board doesn't have a problem with it, and if there's consensus, I see both your heads nodding, I just want to make sure. Um, would it be okay if I let her know that she can confirm that date? <laughs> sure. Um, what That's a like? Saturday, right? Yes. It's a Saturday. And people usually get, usually get permits, and she facilitates that. She's done a great job working on this for years and years and years. So it would be nice if she could just give people the answer and not have to worry about it anymore. So if you're both okay with that, I'll let her know. Yeah, it's good. Um, it's been a good yeah, thing. For yeah, no, many I mean, I, I know the residents look it. forward to it. Yeah, they so. look forward to it. So you know, uh, more power to her for working through it with everybody. Um, all right, I just wrote myself a note to talk to Chris Miller. There's a few things we'll probably come back and talk to you about him and I, mm -hmm. but we're still Brenda and I are still working on. She does the the legwork, but occasionally she bounces questions off of me. Um, end of year work. She's hoping to be able to submit that by next week. Um, there's there is some information that she's waiting on, and that's related to grant funding. So, I wasn't able to go to the walkthrough today for the Gap Three grant over at the um, wastewater treatment plant because I had something come up. But I'm going to reach out to Justin Skelly at DPC to make sure we're all set for the gentleman at the Commonwealth to say, yes, give them money, because we need that mm -hmm. to do the end of year. Um, and then just, we're trying, Pat and I are trying to get into some sort of a rhythm to get, re to get ready for Greg to start, because Greg won't be able to come in um, to pick up paperwork and start doing that until the after Labor Day. So he's away on a family, he's got a family vacation going on. Um, and he sent me, he texted me this morning and said that he would come in the week of Labor Day. So we'll see him in, in town, in the office, we'll see him. And then he'll be here bright and early on the 9th. Yep, we met briefly for coffee today to talk about onboarding and, and just to have a general chat about yeah. how excited we are to have him come on. Yeah. So he is excited. He is, <laughs> he is. He's got, he's got great energy. I think it's going to be a good thing. Um, but we've got to work out, Pat and Christopher and I are going to talk about sort of where everybody's sitting and think that through uh, because I want to, I sort of want to include Greg in that, but he's not here, so we'll have to talk to him when he gets here. But other than that, there's a lot of email that's been going on and a lot of um, research. I've got some public records requests that are going to take a little bit of time to fill, and there's other people that are seeing them as well we come they come in phases where you get lots of public record requests and then nothing and then weird stuff like information that i am glad i don't have to deal with from the treasurer's office <laughs> so those are some of the things that have been going on i've had questions from residents and you know people pop into the office and sometimes that takes a little time away from what i'd like to be doing but um great we're the main focus is getting through the end of year and preparing for special town meeting. Oh, the early voting. Um, hold on a second, I wrote that down. So I just got an email, Cassie was writing it before she left today, around five-ish. Um, early voting is gonna start soon. Early in-person voting is gonna start. So when folks come in, they'll see the um, voting booth set up here at the other end of the main meeting room. Um, so those people that want to do that can come in and do that. And if they have questions about it, they should get in touch with Cassie or look on the website. Um, she's been doing a lot of work trying to facilitate putting more information up there as well as Pat. Pat and I have been going through the website at various points sort of working on things that don't seem to be easy to get to. So we're trying to 
make some inroads in that. And Amy's been helping us make sure we get the meetings up and posted on the YouTube channel so people can watch them. Okay? Great. Do um, you guys have any questions for me? I think I'm good. Okay. Well, um, appreciate that. Uh, I'll take a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Blake Gilmore, aye. Tim Hilchey, aye. Thank you, everyone, for coming.